Today is Sunday, October the 18th, 2020, and today we start the RV10 uh, empennage kit. So uh, before we do that, before we get started on the real plane, I thought I would uh, make a quick video and sort of document the uh, some of the things I've done leading up to this point, uh, the practice kits, and the uh, things I've done to get ready over the last uh, couple of months. So I did go ahead and, you know, before I ordered uh, any real plane parts. Uh, I did go ahead and order from Vans the uh, toolbox and the practice kit that is basically a piece of aileron. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course I bought a lot of tools. So these are, I think this is 35 and then this was $30. Um, pretty small price to pay in the grand scheme of things, especially considering, uh, you know, the tools that it's going to take just to build these things is, uh, you know, costs a lot more than that. Now, there are, there's a minimal set of tools you can buy to do these things that is, you know, not nearly as expensive as buying the pneumatic squeezer and the pneumatic, you know, the, the, uh, the pneumatic drill, for example. Some people don't even uh, buy that at all. But I wanted to go ahead and get uh, as much of the real tools that I intended to use to go ahead and do these things so I get practice, uh, I would get practice, you know, using the tools I intend to use on the plane on the practice kit. So that's what I did. Uh, but so, you know, in terms of what comes with the kits, the toolbox, it's the toolbox, uh, about a one sheet, I think it was one page, front and back, uh, the plans to build it. Uh, all the parts are already bent, so you don't really have to do any of this bending. Uh, you know, it's the sides, the, the bottom and the top basically, uh, the hinge, you know, hardware, things like that, and then you know, a bunch of different sizes of rivets. Uh, for the aileron piece, it actually, uh, you know, it's everything you need to build this. None, this is not bent. You do, that is one of the steps you do to bend that sort of leading edge of the aileron. Uh, it also came with the, this, this thing. It's not really a real part. It's just uh, some aluminum angle and a couple of pieces of sheet and then different different rivets to, you know, to try. Uh, it's just a thing to practice on, practice drilling, uh, you know, match drilling, countersinking, dampling, uh, and then, you know, some pop rivets, some round, uh, you know, standard rivets, flush rivets. Uh, I did more. These holes were not part of it. I wanted to dimple some additional holes. So I did some holes over here. Same thing with drilling there. Uh, basically, you know, I just wanted to use this as a, as a test piece. I slipped off, you know, made plenty of mistakes, slipped off with the rivet gun and pounded the heck out of this thing here. Uh, you know, that's what you want. You want to make your mistakes on these parts. Uh, hopefully you get better before you do the real plane. Uh, this thing came with the empennage kit itself. Uh, didn't realize I was going to get that, but you know, okay, that's cool. I guess if you if you were confident enough to skip all these things, you'd still have a little piece to try your hand at first. Uh, you know, you kind of you know, you cut some angles here and fabricate this piece. It's got some uh, nut plates to uh, dimple and, and uh, countersink and get on there. So yeah, you know, that's that was good. Uh, in terms of what else came with the kits, uh, so for the aileron kit, you know, one sheet of plans, front and back. Uh, you know, front page is building this thing, and then they also mention, uh, you know, before you even start, go make yourself this tool and this tool. Uh, this is a uh, basically a, a, a piece of mild steel with a hole drilled through it and countersunk to be used as the female side of a uh, dimple die. It's for getting into these couple of tight, tight spaces uh, right there. And then also to use it as sort of a, an ad hoc bucking bar. I did build that. Uh, I have since ordered from Cleveland Aircraft Tool the tight quarters dimple die uh, tool, but I, I didn't have it when I did this, so I didn't get a chance to use it yet. Uh, but I made a pretty big mess of one of these rivets trying to use this thing and decided uh, I didn't bother to make the little wooden block thing because I bought a, an edge creasing tool anyway. Uh, 
edge forming tool uh, also from Cleveland Aircraft Tools, so I used it instead. Uh, they also have you making a little uh, jig out of a piece of two by four there. Uh, I did do that. It was it was handy. You could get by without it, but you know a lot of the wings and the horizontal stabilizer, I'll probably end up making jigs for those anyway. Uh, so you don't really reuse that, but it was it was nice to to have. The other thing it comes with uh, the kits. I guess this was the aileron kit came with this, but it may be because I I bought the toolbox and the aileron at the same time, so it all came in the same box. But they give you sections three and five of kind of the common sections of the plans for any plane. Uh, when I bought the Infinage kit, of course, it came with another copy of this. I actually took the uh, the ledger that came with the plans for the Infinage kit and, and sort of put, you know, just, uh, just these sections three and five because I figure I'll keep going back to these uh, and I, that way I'll have to keep flipping around in the real plans. And I put the real plans in a big three-ring binder on the right or whatever it is. So uh, this, you know, what this talks about is what tools you'll need. Uh, section five goes into riveting and you know uh, how to choose a rivet size, how to uh, how to measure and tell uh, you know if you've uh, squeezed the shop head enough but not too much. And uh, that's actually something that I thought I would mention here. If I was given anyone any advice, uh, it would be to they mention uh, in in the section five. Vans tells you, uh, again, they tell you how to, how to measure and determine what size rivet, what length rivet shank to choose. So uh, the rivets will be like an AN426, which is the type of rivet, AD3-3. The, three, the first three uh, is the shank diameter in 30 seconds of an inch. The dash three is the shank length in sixteenths of an inch. So three sixteenths. So dash three is three sixteenths. They detail how you would pick. Now granted in the plans for the plane they're going to tell you what size rivets to use almost everywhere but still uh, they go into detail about you know how you would determine uh, you know what length rivet to use depending on the thickness of the material you're the sum of the thicknesses of the material you're trying to rivet and you know rivets don't come in an infinite number of sizes you're basically you, know, you add it all up you add a certain you know amount of overage and then pick a rivet length that comes closest to that but they also go on to say that you know for a lot of uh you know some for some of their uh you know part of the plane they'll pick the shorter rather than the longer uh rivet length which means you don't have as much material to squeeze and make a, a shop head that is both you know enough diameter uh, and enough height uh, so that's not to say there's not enough material there that they chose the wrong size rivet if you choose too long of a rivet the head will tend to squish down sideways there's different terms for the different mistakes <laughs> that can happen but uh, I tried it I tried a three dash a three dot a dash three point five in a place where uh, you they were calling out a 3-3 in one of these and sure enough it kind of squished over so I can see why they're picking what they're picking but if you buy these gauges that you're supposed to use that you can use to you know sort of measure did you get enough diameter did you get enough height uh, of, of the, the shop head of the rivet well the dash threes between two pieces of dimpled skins uh, it's hard to get it just right and I really worried about that uh, you know kept thinking well I'm, I'm never gonna you know get that good at bucking or squeezing a rivet just right to where it's it's big enough in diameter but not not squished down too flat so uh, you know again that really bothered me in the in section five where they talk about riveting they go through all the rules of thumb about you know how to do it they mention you can get gauges but then they also say mm, you know there's some there's some margin 
and they reference this military specification from 1977, 1974 originally. Uh, so it's mil-r-471-471968. It's a very handy little document, and the most important part uh, to me was, so, you know, here, here we talk about you know, the, the way the rivet should be squeezed, but they also have this table with, you know, the minimum driven head diameter for a given rivet size and, you know, minimum and maximum uh, of the head height. And what you find if you, you know, regardless of the little gauges that you can buy, what you find is if you take a set of calipers and you squeeze a rivet and you go look, it's, there, there's, you got plenty of margin, even with the 3-3. Three -three. Uh, so that made me feel a lot better uh, about the work I was doing on, you know, even even as far back as the first thing I did. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that that helped a lot. Uh, just put my mind at ease. So, as far as you know, mistakes I made on these. Um, that was the first part. I slipped off, dented the heck out of it. Uh, but that's okay. On uh, the toolbox, I made a couple of mistakes that were pretty pretty bad, and it was just misunderstanding the plans, but still works as a toolbox. Um, on this piece, nothing too major. I did uh, get frustrated with one of these rivets where the, the edge kind of uh, sort of bent up. I don't know, it's hard to explain. It, it wouldn't have affected anything, but I just, just doesn't look so great. This guy I saved for last because I wanted uh, one of the, the most airplane looking piece uh, to be sort of the final exam. And I did a lot of different experiments. You know, one of the things I did was I peeled all the glue off of the top skin and I did this, you know, used a soldering iron to leave the blue uh, vinyl protective plastic stuff on the bottom skin. That way I could get a feel for, you know, how much does that help? Because doing the soldering iron thing, it's, it's a pain. Um, you know, if you don't have to do it and it doesn't make a big difference, then you know, I'd want to know that. Uh, in terms of, you know, what do I think? Well, it is a lot nicer on this side now. It's, I have since scuffed this up with Scotch Brite to, to sort of see what that's like, because that's what you'll do before you paint the plane anyway. Uh, the trailing edge, I got it pretty straight. That's pretty important. Uh, I did get it nice and straight, but uh, at least you know, this way, uh, but it does have kind of a, 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 a curve like that. Uh, really disappointed in that, and it had to do with how I clamped it down. I used double sticky, double sided tape uh, here that the, uh, you know, section five talks about doing uh, riveted trailing edges, and it mentions using uh, tank sealant. In fact, the plans talk about tank sealant but they basically say you can use this 3M, you know, give some part number, uh, type of double-sided tape, which that's what I chose to do. I thought, well, if that works out well, then it's a lot less messy than dealing with tank sealant. In the end, I don't know if it was the fault of the double-sided tape. You, you know, you, I think with tank sealant, you'd be able to kind of get the pieces together and start clamping them down and stuff would kind of squish around. You'd have some, you know, some play. Uh, before it all sets up with a double-sided tape basically it sticks and, and that's that right you can peel it apart and retry but it's in so I think I'm going to go with the tank sealant on uh, on the real I want to do the rudder and we'll see how that goes uh, these tight spaces I, you know, I had the tool that I made for the plans but I still uh, really boogered up uh, one of those one of those holes and finally ended up drilling it out a couple of times to the point that I, I just drilled it out and put a pop rivet in. Um, one of, I think my first, yeah, that one was pretty bad. My first rivet from skin to spar, uh, getting down in there and I, with the bucking bar and holding everything still, I messed it up enough times that I messed it up, drilled it out, messed it up, drilled it out. Um, finally, the hole got too big uh, and I ended up, 
I didn't have any oops rivets, uh, but I did have a rivet that I had started to squeeze and it, it had started to get, you know, the, the shank got wider all the way down the length of the shank. Basically, I created my own oops rivet accidentally and I used that in, in a hole. I ended up drilling the hole out to one eighth inch hole uh, and using that rivet in there and it, it worked out okay. I mean, it's not pretty, but it got there. It got the job done. Uh, other things I've learned, let's see, I mean that was pretty much it. This would certainly, it's strong, it's amazing how strong you know this is once the structure is, is uh, formed. This would fly, I, you know, I think this would be a totally safe part on an airplane. Uh, cosmetically, it's not great, but it's not terrible. I've certainly seen worse on real airplanes uh, after a few years of, of uh, wear and tear. So, uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm ready to, to do the real, the real deal. Um, you know, again, I, I, I learned a lot of things. Uh, mostly, to me, the most important thing is just the confidence uh, that came with, you know, reading this document about some of the rivets and then, uh, you know, messing up a rivet, drilling it out, being able to drill it out and, and get it out of there and, and then, you know, come back and, and fix it, that kind of thing. Uh, another kind of experiment I've been running, these pieces have been, uh, so I, I put these together and then I, I scuffed it up and left it out on my, uh, outside on my back porch, back patio, um, or deck rather, just sitting on the table. I thought, and it's been out there for months. Now, I know that's not a very long time in the grand scheme of things, but I thought, okay, I'm trying to decide uh, the endless primer debate, to prime or not to prime the inside. And I thought, well, let me sort of scuff up the, uh, scuff the cladding off and then leave this out. And I, on the back side, I, I didn't scuff it. So that's still nice and shiny. And then I just left this out in the rain uh, again for a couple months, I think now. And you know, I, I don't see any, <laughs> it's not that long really, and I'll put it back out there, but I don't see any noticeable, uh, you know, other than some oxidation, I guess. It's not like it's gonna disintegrate. Uh, so, you know, I'll just keep that sort of test going. Yeah, that's about it. So I'm starting on the vertical stabilizer today and uh, pretty excited.